You're listening to episode 84 of Positively. I'm still your host, Rocio Carvajal, food anthropologist, Mexican culture, and gastronomy educator. And through this podcast, I explore the gastronomic traditions and cultural history of Mexico. You can find more information about these and my other podcasts, lectures, food tour, and publications on the description of the show. Or better yet, you can subscribe for free to my newsletter, which I only send when a new episode is released. Hello, hello there. Long time no see. To say I have been busy these past months will be a bit of an understatement. After a dreamy winter break last December in icy Amsterdam, Germany and Belgium, topped with a very eager Christmas in Copenhagen and Sweden, life got very busy very quickly. So as I sit to record this episode, I just finished my first year of my PhD And in all honesty, this has been the most mm, stressful, challenging academic period of my life. And most of the time, it was, you know, pretty hard to enjoy it. But I have indeed learned and growth a lot. And I'm sure we'll come to appreciate it later. Uh, maybe in, I don't know, three years time. <laughs> So I have been wanting to remaster some of the old episodes of the show, but after listening to the original files of the first and second part of this coffee special, I decided that it would be best and uh, much more fun to re-record it, just because I miss doing the podcast so much, and also because I needed to update uh, some of the information that was here. So I hope that some of you out there have missed the show too, so you will enjoy this comeback. I promise I will take time to prepare at least one long episode during the summer, which will be recorded now in sunny Yorkshire. But for now, I hope you enjoy this classic and refreshed episode where you will learn about the history of coffee in Mexico, when and how it was introduced into Latin America, and how Mexicans fell in love with it. Please do check the notes on this episode on your podcast app because I will leave some coffee-related links for you. Remember, you can always reach out to me on Instagram and Twitter and also drop me a line to hello at passageportle.com and the links for all that are on the uh, notes of the show. Alrighty, make yourself a cup of cafecito and let's get on with the show. I hope you enjoy this episode. The cultural history of coffee drinking in Mexico is an area full of possibilities of exploration. In other words, there is very little written about it. Most historical studies are centered on the agricultural, political and economic aspects of the production, but there isn't much written about the traditions associated with the enjoyment of the drink itself or coffee-based products. While researching and re-researching for this episode, it soon became clear that Not surprisingly, the presence of coffee culture is all more evident or stronger in the regions where it is produced. And also in central Mexico, where the capital is located and the surrounding metropolis that have historically attracted a cosmopolitan society by welcoming people of all nations. And I think it is useful to mention that Mexico's complex geography is partly responsible for the many regional traditions. So, the evolution of food and cultural practices have been determined by local agricultural practices and types of development models. For instance, while the notion of progress in the arid northern part of Mexico meant a rapid industrialization, The same notion of prosperity in the South has always been linked to agricultural success. What it is clear is that for the best part of the 19th century, drinking coffee had many class connotations, and it's even fair to say 
that it has been only in the last 15 years or so that Mexicans have gradually embraced a richer culture of coffee drinking. When I was a child, and even a teenager, there were no fancy coffee shops. There were very few brands available, most of them instant, and the options were reduced to, you know, really crappy coffee that was... uh, you know, prepared black or, you know, milky cups or hyper sweet café de olla. And indeed, I have fond memories of the combined smell of tobacco and coffee at my paternal grandparents' house. But besides old people, probably the bohemian type were the only consumers of coffee throughout the 70s, 80s and even 90s. We have come a long way indeed, and while I don't celebrate the advent of unicorn diabetes-inducing drinks, coffee is for the first time in the nation's history a highly democratized drink. Bear in mind, I am not talking about the quality or types of preparation or methods of extraction, but the influence of global coffee chains in this case have actually been partially responsible for this change in its popularization. In the past seven years or so, there has been an increase in the number of um, initiatives promoted by the federal government and many specialized coffee organizations to support small producers, provide specialized training, strengthening distribution and supply chains, and even encouraging coffee speciality businesses. But let me stop myself here with this introduction, because This part of the episode is about the origins of coffee, and I really want to tell you this story from the very beginning. It is hard to imagine, at least for me, facing the day without the boost of a steaming cup of coffee early in the morning. Whether it is black, cappuccino, café de olla, sweetened with jaggery and cinnamon, a creamy café con leche, espresso with almond, soya or even oatmeal drink, for many of us it is a daily staple. Mexicans consume an annual average of 1.2, give or take, kilos of coffee, a less than modest amount if you compare it with, say, Luxembourg that consumes equivalent of 11.1 kilos of ground beans per capita. That is for 2022. And it is all the more surprising when you think that Mexico's southeast falls right into the so-called coffee belt. This is a horizontal strip that sandwiches the equator between the tropics of Cancer and Capricorn. All the countries that are located in this section of the planet share more or less the same climatic characteristics that favours the production of coffee and many other crops like cacao, chilies and dozens of tropical fruits. The largest introduction of foreign crops in Mexico occurred in the 16th century. With the exception of sugarcane, most of the fruits and vegetables that were introduced were already staple crops around Europe. Coffee has a long and fascinating history of its own, and it's really worth beginning with its origins, not only because it's a great excuse to navigate across time and cultures, chasing one of the world's most beloved drinks, but also it will help us establish some background information to frame the relevance of this prodigious plant and the sublime qualities of its seeds. The apparent accidental discovery and consequent domestication of coffee is believed to have taken place around the 9th century. Legend has it, emphasis on legend, that a young goat herder from the Oromo nomadic tribe in today's Ethiopia noticed that every year around the same time his goats were euphoric after eating the fruits from a bush and they were jumping non-stop, climbing and kicking everywhere. After following the goats, he discovered the plump red berries of this plant. He tried some, and after a short while, he noticed that he wasn't at all tired and felt very energized. 
he decided to collect some of the berries and took them back to show them to his people. At first, they took very little interest in the berries. They didn't have much flavor and some tossed them into the fire. Soon, the smell of the roasting berries and seeds awakened their curiosity. And thus, the culinary experimentation with coffee began. And the rest became history. Oh, well, that's a little nice tale, isn't it? But I'm afraid to say that other than the region, period, and, you know, probably the part about the coats is true, the rest is just another food legend. There is, however, archaeological evidence that supports the fact that modern-day Saudi Arabia, Ethiopia, and Yemen were the first coffee drinkers in the world. And this region alone is home to more than 5,000 different varieties of Arabica Robusta, the planet's most popular coffee cultivar. There aren't any conclusive theories about the dissemination of the plant and the drink, but it is clear enough that by the early 1400s, all the Arab-speaking countries had adopted both. Like many luxury products from the Middle East, like spices, coffee was first introduced into Europe via the maritime trade routes of the Mediterranean Sea and possibly also via the Silk Route. But it wasn't until the first decade of the 1600s that Italian merchants started actively promoting the consumption of coffee to grow their trade business. And driven by this strong motivation, is no wonder why coffee culture and instruments to aid its preparation rapidly developed to come up with more sophisticated methods of preservation, roasting, grinding and extraction. It didn't take too long for European countries to adopt the drink, and by 1652 the first coffee stall appeared in London. Twenty years later, Paris also adopted it and saw the opening of its first coffee house in 1675. In 1685, an American merchant, probably of German origin, uh, by the name of Johannes Theodat, opened the first coffee house in Vienna, Austria. The city's enthusiasm and appetite for indulgent desserts rapidly incorporated coffee drinking as part of their social rituals. It became such a complex and significant part of their costumes that the culture of the Vienna coffee house was listed many centuries later as intangible cultural heritage by UNESCO. Many years later, a French naval officer was one of the many accidental heroes of this story, or at least for the next chapter, because he decided to take seedlings of coffee bushes from the French Royal Botanical Gardens and travelled with them on a mission in 1723 that was heading to the French colonies in the Antilles, specifically Martinique. It only took less than 50 years for coffee to become one of the most profitable crops of the Caribbean French territories, with more than 19 million thriving coffee plants. Around this time, the French and Dutch Caribbean colonies had constant political disputes, and one of them was eased by the impartial and very diplomatic intervention of the Kingdom of Brazil, which back then was still a Portuguese colony. The dispute was indeed ended in 1727, but the diplomat and sergeant major Francisco de Melo Paleta managed to smuggle French coffee seeds from Guyana, and that is how coffee made its way into Brazil. From there, it quickly propagated into Jamaica, Colombia, Bolivia, Costa Rica, El Salvador, Venezuela, Haiti, Santo Domingo, and eventually Mexico. In fact, the introduction of coffee in Mexico may have occurred without anyone taking much notice. You see, 
With 3,294 kilometers of coastline in the Gulf of Mexico and Caribbean, plus 7,828 kilometers of coastline in the Pacific, many crops, not only coffee, found their way into the territory through hundreds of entry points. Now, while Mexico is indeed located in North America, some parts of the southeast are right in the Coffee Belt region that shares, like I said, similar conditions to many African nations where coffee originated. Now let's take a look at six key historical facts related to coffee in Mexico. One of the oldest documents that mentions coffee in New Spain is an interesting paper from 1792 issued by the Viceregal government. It is an order indicating that all utensils and machinery imported for the purposes of processing coffee and sugarcane would be exempt from taxation. 2. It is commonly assumed that the Spanish landowner Juan Antonio Gómez de Guevara planted one of the first, if not the very first, commercial coffee plantation at his state, the Hacienda de Guadalupe in Amatlán de los Reyes in the coastal state of Veracruz. 3. Another important document is of merchant trade records from the port of Veracruz that um, declare a cargo of 272 quintales, which is about 13,600 kilos of coffee in 1802. Further inland, in the humid and hot state of Morelos in 1809, the first crops of coffee were planted in the cities of Cuernavaca and Yautepec. Also, this was a region where sugarcane was widely cultivated because, well, it's uh, very humid and there is an abundance of water. 5. The Eden-like state of Chiapas welcomed the crop in 1820, but it wasn't until 1846 when um, the Italian Geronimo de Mancherini created the first commercial plantations in this region. And last, much later in the state of Oaxaca, on the Pacific coast, one clergyman by the name of José María Cortés planted coffee allotments in the high mountains of San Agustín Los Chicha in 1854. As you can see, the introduction of coffee as a crop didn't quite follow a specific pattern and it was pretty much the result of uh, personal initiatives from landowners. And this is particularly significant because it determined from then onwards the highly regionalized and different productions of coffee. Now, have you ever wondered why coffee, perhaps more than any other drink in the world, has had a steady increase in its consumption, popularity and adoption into food cultures? Well, it is fair to say that in all continents around the world, coffee has transcended ideologies, political inclinations, religions, diets, lifestyles and even social status. In recent years, we have gone to considerable lengths to justify why we drink or should drink coffee using scientific data. And thanks to that, we know all about, you know, the high levels of antioxidants that it has, hyperstimulation of the senses and the byproduct of endorphin production that are behind our love and addiction to coffee. <laughs> In essence, I think we need it more than we love it. But coffee also has divided the world into producers and consumers. Over the decades, the gap between a high consumption coffee culture and the social constructs around it seem to be more complex in non-producing countries. I mean, you can explain that because it's a commodity. And if something is scarce, well, it creates um, a sort of inflated desire to have it. If you remember at the top of the show, I mentioned that Luxembourg, 
that has no possibility whatsoever of producing coffee. It's also the nation where people consume more than um, 11.1 kilos of coffee a year, compared to Mexico, for instance, where we drink 1.2, more or less, kilos per capita. The popularization of coffee drinking in Mexico coincided with the production of it. I mean, this is no surprise, obviously. Um, and that occurred not long after the independence from Spain. And its adoption as you know, a proper, fashionable, sophisticated drink occurred much later, largely influenced by the costumes of the court of Maximilian I of the House of Habsburg, who was the second emperor of Mexico from 1864 to 1867. During this brief but, you know, culturally significant period, anything that came from Europe, namely arts, fashion, architecture, and of course, food, was seen as desirable and highly aspirational for the middle and upper classes. And I think this is a perfect chance for me to plug a fantastic conversation I had with Dr. Edward Shawcross, who is the author of the book The Last Emperor of Mexico, the dramatic story of the Habsburg Archduke who created a kingdom in the New World. And that was episode 78 of the show, and I will leave a link for you on the notes, but you can just scroll in the list of episodes on your app. Well, during the short Habsburg Empire, large and wealthy Mexican cities attracted European restaurateurs and patissiers, who immediately profited from Mexicans' growing obsession with anything French or Austrian. Wannabe aristocrats loved being seen drinking coffee or served it when entertaining guests because it was an unquestionable sign of good taste. And it also coincided with the first um, architectural makeover, or oh, first uh, makeover of plazas, gardens. It was almost as if all leisure activities were beginning to be reinvented, and the self-proclaimed Mexican aristocracy didn't hesitate in taking full ownership of these spaces and their enjoyments, and drinking coffee was a common denominator. <laughs> Fast forward to the final years of uh, the 19th century and we find that the national production of coffee had for the very first time had a deliberate intervention from the state to promote its exports. Unsurprisingly, one of Mexico's main buyer of coffee was the US. This crop was one of the most profitable exports of the nation at the time. But who were the people behind this production? Attracting foreign investment to help the development and industrialization of the country and improve agricultural production was a top priority for Porfirio Diaz's government that actively promoted and facilitated the acquisition of farming lands particularly in the states of Chiapas, Campeche, Yucatán, Tabasco and Veracruz. And so, dozens of investors came and built their own haciendas. These wealthy immigrants from Italy, Belgium, Greece and England and lots of Prussians flocked to the Soconusco Mountains of Chiapas. By 1881, The most successful coffee haciendas of Chiapas had names like Germania, Nueva Alemania, Hamburgo, Bremen, Lubecca, Hanover, and Baderna. And yes, I'm uh, pronouncing them with a Spanish accent because this is how they were known. And there were also some well-known family names in the region uh, who were these very powerful families. And they were the Kellers, Kalle, Geisenmann, Lutman, Edelmann, Reigenhagen, Polms, Windemeyer, and Sonnemann. Unlike most immigrants who came to seek their fortune in Mexico, Germans, or rather Prussians, often went back to their own country to marry other wealthy women. 
And there was another, you know, widespread practice that was just having arranged marriages among coffee producing families. Coffee cultivation in Mexico became so successful that it even displaced tobacco and became the most profitable crop, with haciendas distributed among 13 coffee producing states in the country. Now, to finish this first part of the episode, let's have a look at some of the most uh, popular ways to drink coffee in Mexico that became popular at the turn of the 20th century. Upper class cafes served mm, kind of national equivalents of Viennese coffee served with cream. Street coffee sellers offered ready-made coffee flavored with cinnamon and more of market street vendors had little stalls with actual coffee machines and they used to prepare and serve coffee right on the spot. More humble versions of coffee were also made at home and also sold at uh, popular eateries or fondas at markets. And people could buy a more diluted coffee that was boiled in clay pots, or yes, heavily sweetened with jaggery or piloncillo and flavoured with cinnamon. And the style of coffee, as most of you know already, is a national favourite, and we know it by the name of Café de Olla. Coffee has that unique quality that can adapt to any social occasion, meal of the day, and taste preferences. It is a breakfast staple, but also ideal for long post-meal conversations. And believe me when I say that Mexicans don't need any excuse to indulge uh, whenever there is a chance to have a nice cup of coffee. We even have it during funerals, uh, it's very common, and it's usually served with a good splash of rum, brandy or tequila. Famous to this day are the Veracruz-style lecheros, which um, are half milk and half coffee uh, drinks and they're served in tall glasses with no handle. So burning your hands is part of the experience. <laughs> But it's also quite nice to see how they serve it because they pour it from a considerable height uh, from a kettle into those glasses and it produces a really, really nice bubbly foam. Uh, besides producing this show, I also produce a Hungry Books podcast, a show which at the moment is in hiatus, but you can enjoy many episodes that dissect fascinating books on the subject of food. I also have a podcast a mini series in Spanish called Espejo Antropológico or Anthropological Mirror, featuring interviews with researchers discussing contemporaneous anthropological research in Mexico. And much of my research also goes into my ebooks. And these are, well, cookbooks, also um, cultural gastronomic history. And so far, I have written um, Mexican fiestas, Mexican street food, Mexican chocolate, and uh, Mexican market food. And they are all digital, and you can purchase a copy from my uh, also digital book stand. And like all independent producers, I really, really appreciate when you share my shows uh, with others, purchase my ebooks and support my work. And the links for all my projects are on the show's uh, notes and also on these episode's notes. You can really make a difference by helping me keeping this project alive. So thank you. Part two. So earlier on, we found out that coffee was uh, first used for culinary purposes in Eritrea, modern day Ethiopia, around the 9th century. But it wasn't until the 1700s when it was introduced into the Americas by a French naval officer who took some plants to the French Antilles in the Caribbean. And from there, it was disseminated to South, uh, Central, and North America. The entry points in Mexico were the coastal states of Oaxaca, Guerrero, 
and Chiapas in the Pacific coast, and Veracruz, Tabasco, and Chiapas again on the other side that faces the Gulf of Mexico. During the 19th century, German, Italian, and Swiss investors were behind the coffee production um, in Mexico all the way through the early 20th century. And during that period, new tastes, food practices, habits, and trends influenced how Mexicans came to incorporate coffee into their diet and lifestyle. So now let's see how coffee makes it from the fields to your hands and kisses your lips every morning or evening or night. <laughs> and I will also break down for you um, what the fancy specialty coffee is all about and what does a cup of excellence mean in Mexico today. I really don't know where each of you are listening to the podcast right now, but there are only three alternatives. Either you are listening from a coffee producing region, in which case you are somewhere around the coffee belt, or you are in the northern or southern hemisphere and you rely on international imports to enjoy that lovely cup every day. Now, I am really fortunate because I spent a fair amount of time up here in the Northern Hemisphere, in the central high plains of Mexico. So the type of coffee I normally consume doesn't really need to travel much. Last year, the 2022 national production of coffee was of 386,000 tons that made their way to practically all continents. And at least for last year, uh, Mexico was in the 11th place of the coffee producing nations list. That is, well, invariably led by Brazil. And last year, um, Brazil was followed by Vietnam, then Colombia, Indonesia, Ethiopia, Uganda, India, Honduras, Peru. And, um, well, after it was us. Mexico has hundreds of ecotones. That means um, these are areas where two different ecosystems collide and they produce magical microclimates where semi-tropical crops can thrive like vanilla, cacao, mangoes and coffee. And the largest producing states are Chiapas, Veracruz, Puebla, Oaxaca and Guerrero. A few years ago, I visited the allotments and house of Don Eduardo Lalo Vázquez, a small coffee producer from Zapotitlán de Méndez in the northern mountains of Puebla. This visit turned out to be a memorable life lesson in resilience, dedication and the unbreakable faith in nature. That sounds very poetic, but the truth is that his life has been on a constant pendulum of bonanza periods and bankruptcy. Because small producers like Don Lalo are key to source premium quality batches that can reach incredibly high prices, but also are very vulnerable because of the fluctuations of international markets, changes in weather patterns and plagues. But first, let's see uh, which are the steps that take place in order for you to pour a cup of coffee. Well, we normally know as coffee beans, technically, well, they're not beans. <laughs> they're just the half seeds of coffee berries or cherries that are dried, roasted and ground and brewed to produce the drink we know as coffee. And it all starts with a sprouting seed, the promise of life. After sprouting, Coffee seedlings or young plants are carefully nurtured in shade beds. Once they are strong enough, young bushes are planted in the fields and grow for three or five years on average to reach maturity and start consistently producing cherries. 
most um, semi-tropical coffee producing countries can have up to two harvests, one in mid or late spring and the second takes place in the late autumn. The berries or cherries have a deep red color and are not much bigger than an average uh, fresh cranberry. While some large producers use machines to harvest, the best way to ensure a good quality selection is hand picking. Next, the cherries are taken into the facilities where they will be processed. The two most common ways to get the seeds ready for roasting are the dry and wet methods. The wet method requires to submerge the cherries in water to separate unripe or sick fruits. The healthy cherries will sink at the bottom and they will be transferred into beds where the pulp will slowly ferment between 24 and 46 hours before rinsing off the fermented red skin and pulp. The seeds or beans are laid to dry for several days in uh, just cement covered areas or patios and they are allowed to just rest under the sun. Farmers gently turn them every 30 minutes or so because this prevents the formation of mold. After this, the dried skin can be easily removed by hauling the beans in a dry mill, at which point the seed will split and the individual halves or beans are clean and ready to be selected and sorted. The dry method, by comparison, removes the pulp completely and from there, the naked seeds are sent straight away to the drying patios. In high-tech processing plants, this stage can be done using drying machines. Selecting the beans Contrary to popular belief, the quality of a good coffee is not determined by how it's prepared. It actually begins long before the beans are even roasted. This really starts right when the cherries are handpicked, cleaned and the beans are ready for selection. Coffee experts grade the dry beans by looking for a consistent color, hardness, damages, weight and texture, among other details. Once each batch of a crop is graded, the beans are ready to be packed and exported or to be sent for roasting. And that takes us to the next step, which is roasting and grinding. This process doesn't always take place at the facilities of coffee farms, because many companies, large and small, prefer doing this themselves to control all aspects of the final stage and will take care of the final packaging and commercialization to present it to the consumer. Roasting machines provide a controlled and constant source of dry heat and also movement to evenly roast the beans. These will completely eliminate all residual humidity and will even the intensity of the you know, dark color that the roasting gives to the beans. And this will help release the natural oils of the seeds and produce different flavors, aromas and densities of the drink. Most commercial brands of coffee from transnational companies by the likes of Nestlé, Nero, Starbucks, Costa, Ely, Kraft, um, Coop Café, they don't actually grow any coffee. Uh, they only do the second part, which is the processing. So they import uh, roast, grind, package and make coffee-based drinks and, of course, sell them to the public. And these are broadly the stages that the coffee production chain has. Now, as our awareness about the social and environmental impact of the coffee industry has increased, so have our consumption habits. And by choosing to buy directly from producers, we're effectively contributing to making a direct impact into the lives of coffee farmers and coffee producing countries. Our education about coffee making has also changed, so that has impacted the way we consume it. 
For instance, it is really interesting to see how the coffee culture in Mexico has rapidly changed over the last decades. While most urban young adults have incorporated coffee into their morning rituals, the drink is actually far from being a national breakfast staple, believe it or not. Its appreciation is actually framed by the social function it has, you know, as a mid-morning or post-meal pretext to meet up with co-workers, friends and loved ones to relax. For several years, I have attended the Latin American Coffee Summit and have had the chance to talk to many producers, traders and representatives of coffee organizations. And they all acknowledge that coffee culture in Mexico is rapidly changing. You know, it's also creating new cultural practices. But another trend has been occurring, that is that some people are opting out for higher qualities of coffee that is significantly more expensive. And they're creating... uh, you know, different ways to consume it. And of course, it's tied into habits of sociability, but, you know, they consider it to be more sophisticated, whatever that means. Nowadays, Mexico occupies a good place among the 15 top organic coffee producers in the world. Most of this valuable production is destined to the American and European markets. But Mexican coffee actually faces many challenges. And one of them is the international market's own fluctuations because of variations in the supply and demand of coffee around the world. The prices directly affect the economy of thousands of farmers. Other threats are plagues, such as um, coffee leaf rust, known in Spanish as roya, that bleaches and dries the leaves, killing the plant, and they can no longer photosynthesize the sunlight. This disease alone has cut in half the production of coffee in Mexico in the last five years. An article published by D.R. Wakefield, a British coffee trading company, highlights that what makes the coffee production in Mexico very attractive for socially responsible companies is the increasing number of farming co-ops that ensure fair prices and minimize the risk of abuse and corruption. And this model, they praise, owes its success to civic organization and is by far one of the most successful social business movements in the world. Each of the producing regions in Mexico has distinctive flavors and profiles. For instance, Oaxacan coffee is known uh, for its chocolate-like aftertaste, while Veracruz's coffee is richer with knotty and sweet notes. Poblano coffee has a unique caramel and walnut-like flavors, and Chiapas uh, produces cherry chocolate-like aromas. Now, As I mentioned, the largest producers of coffee in Latin America remain to be, you know, Brazil, Colombia and Honduras, primarily because of the volume that their agro industry can handle. And while Mexico can't really compete in the same way, it has opted out for a different strategy, that is small production of extremely good quality coffee, which has consistently gained international recognition. This has marked the new era for Mexican speciality coffee. And no, it has nothing to do with curled moustaches and hipster dens serving coffee in jam jars. Let me explain first what is not a speciality coffee. You might have heard about coffee brewing. You know, drip coffee makers... French presses, espresso machines, mocha pot and aeropress. Well, all of these are methods of extraction that will produce different densities in the drink and bring out um, different flavors and aromas. But that is not what makes a speciality coffee. Instead, these are the characteristics we need to consider. First of all, the magic begins in the beans. There are two main varieties of coffee plants, Arabica and Robusta. Arabica varieties um, produce a big range of flavors and notes, but it is also very delicate and easily spoiled. Robusta, which means strong, on the other hand, has a much bitter, deeper taste. 
It has fewer layers of flavors, and it is considered inferior to Arabica, in spite of how easy it is to grow in comparison. So, for a specialty coffee, you have to start with a 100% batch of Arabica beans. Next, we have the combination of uh, several factors. The region um, in the world where this coffee is produced, all considerations of altitude, acidity of the soil, age of the plant, types of crops that grow in the vicinity, all of that will affect the flavor of the beans. And it is really, really important to maintain a strict quality control during the harvesting, selection and cleaning, also drying and storing. And all of these steps are actually graded by professionals using a set of scores that must range between 80 and 100 points to be considered as speciality. The care or lack thereof in any step can make or break a whole harvest. And bear in mind that all of this happens way before the roasting, grinding and brewing. In short, for a coffee to be considered as speciality requires the specialized combined work and knowledge of farmers, buyers, roasters and baristas to reach a consumer who by this point is often quite the connoisseur who is not afraid to spend what is needed on this type of coffee. The cost of a single cup of speciality coffee can range between $6 and $16. But the value is actually placed not only in the supreme quality of the drink, which you know in itself is the whole reason uh, for the existence of the mammoth effort behind it, but you are actually buying into the whole ethos of the production chain. Now, will you actually like speciality coffee more than regular coffee? coffee? Well, not necessarily. Now, I have to say that I have tried many types of espressos, americanos of different specialty coffees, all Mexican and all winners of multiple international accolades. And I noted satsuma, honey, flowers and chocolate notes in the aftertaste. They were really like nothing I have ever had before and they were very expensive as well so that's not really a kind of coffee that I can afford on a daily basis. But if you can afford it every now and then, uh, really go for it. The point is that if you have the chance to broaden your experience and understanding of coffee beyond the usual, you know, milky staples, you definitely um, should do it, at least in my opinion. And why am I telling you this? Because, you know, I really believe that um, coffee is like wine. And like any wine connoisseur will tell you that the best wine or the best coffee is really the one you like. In any case, the key aspect here is that while I'm perfectly happy drinking a home-brewed coffee every day without having to get a mortgage to support my habit, I can still make the effort to opt out for buying a socially and environmentally uh, responsible coffee that will not only contribute to a personal ethical satisfaction, of course, but it will be also making an impact for the people that produce it. Okay, now let's uh, get a little bit deeper into what a cup of excellence is. Uh, because really, the world of coffee is absolutely fascinating. And you can see why it attracts so many enthusiasts who go to great lengths to educate themselves to become quite the connoisseurs. Now, Taza de Excelencia, or Cup of Excellence, is a prestigious international competition that is celebrated every year and was created by the um, NGO Alliance for Coffee Excellence. And as pompously explained on their website, this is the equivalent of the Oscars for the coffee world. And it is actually a relatively new competition that started only in 1999. And uh, in previous years, Mexico has had the opportunity to be the host of the Cup of Excellence competition. And what happens um, in this event is that the jury has to analyze and evaluate 
hundreds of submissions from around the world. And only those who score about 86 of these um, grades that I mentioned about specialty coffee, uh, they can enter this final selection. And the impact of this competition is really, really important for producers because all of these evaluations for each brand and group of producers will allow them to enter international auctions and sell literally tons of high quality coffee at premium prices. Now to begin wrapping up the episode, I will say that coffee like um, cacao is one of those prodigious plants whose fruits have reached almost every corner of the world and have transformed landscapes, tastes, practices and rituals. And now let me give you some great scientific excuses to drink coffee. <laughs> These are some arguments uh, by the American Journal of uh, Gastroenterology and the American Heart Association and, you know, for good measure, the World's Health Organization. So all of these entities say the following. This is something that we already know, that caffeine is a stimulant. But what kind of stimulant exactly? Um, well, it is a psychoactive, meaning it gives you a rush of energy straight into your brain. That means um, your nervous system. Enhancing neurotransmitters, releasing dopamine, which is a substance that controls our feelings of happiness and motivation. It also increases the speed of your metabolism, helping you perform better when exercising. And that's why a lot of people will actually drink coffee before exercising to perform better. Also, it has been proven to help in um, leveling insulin and can prevent, in many cases, certain types of diabetes. Again, this is if you don't drink it with lots and lots of sugar, of course. And coffee can also lower the risk of liver cancer, apparently. And last but not least, coffee is absolutely loaded with antioxidants, which, you know, in short, should slow down the aging process of your body. Now, uh, not only Mexican coffee is gaining recognition outside Mexico, but also inside Mexico too. And I know this sounds a bit silly, but sometimes it is the case that um, things are more famous outside than inside. Uh, but there's an increasing number of events with uh, traders, farmers and roasters that are promoted by Ame Cafe, which is a Mexican association of coffee production and the Mexican association of specialty coffee shops. And the two most important coffee trade events in Mexico are Expo Cafe and Gourmet and the Latin American Coffee Summit. Some of my uh, favorite coffee brands, uh, kind of top of my head, are Café Bola de Oro from Veracruz. It's really, really yummy. Café Tosepan and Macehual from my home state of Puebla. And that is produced by an amazing, extraordinary co-op of indigenous farmers. And one I don't drink really often because I don't go to Oaxaca that often. But I really like Café La Brújula. Mm which sells different varieties of coffee from Oaxaca. And my favorite is Pluma from the mountains. Well, there you have it. A very brief account of the history and present of coffee in Mexico, which I hope you have enjoyed. I have left many, many, many links uh, on the notes of this episode for the brands, uh, websites, events and um, articles that I mentioned. Remember, if you love the show, Help me, please uh, continue doing it by recommending it to your friends. Buy my ebooks, which are on my digital book stand. Um, the links for that are on the description of the show and you can look them up on your podcast app. Also, um, muy importante, leave a five star review for the podcast, um, whichever platform you use to stream it. Well, I think that's all for me today. It was so nice to be back on the microphones. Yay! Take care and until the next time, which I hope is soon enough. Bye-bye.